one. Hello, I am a small TV. Okay. Hello, everybody. Oh my goodness, it's Daniel Hakias from San Diego. Here I am. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, cool. But Welcome, no. everyone. Uh, I'm going to do a brief introduction to this week's Latinx, Latinx, Super Amigos Playwriting Hour. I'm so glad you're here for week two. Um, this is really exciting. Um, it's really exciting to be here again with Alvaro Sarrios, who's a playwright from Chicago. And, uh, you know, we're, he and I are just, uh, we're just starting to get to know each other. Uh, you know, and you all was, joined. Yeah. We just, uh, <laughs> We just, uh, we met recently, but you know, we've, we've sort of uh, kind of mixed uh, streams here, but I'm really excited to have Alvaro here from Chicago and uh, to lead this exciting workshop. And I can't wait to hear what you, what you, uh, what you're gonna share with us. So, gracias. Great, thank you. Take it away, Alvaro. All right, thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for uh, tuning in. Um, thank you, uh, uh, Tlaloc uh, and Thea and, and Howron uh, for giving me this uh, opportunity to be here. And to those of you who are actually participating through Zoom and uh, those watching for, through Facebook Landia, I say thank you very much. Um, and actually, if you're watching through Facebook, I'd love to know where uh, people are watching this from. So if you're, you're up for it, feel free to type in the comment section. Um, where you're appearing, uh, where you're watching this from. I promise I'll read them later. I mean, what else am I gonna do, right? I'm just locked here and home, just like the rest of you guys. Um, and uh, just like the, uh, um, uh, as, as Slalak did uh, during his uh, presentation, um, I too would like to dedicate this workshop to uh, playwright Diane Rodriguez. Um, the work she did with the performance troupe uh, Latins Anonymous and her own work um, as a playwright inspired me to start telling my own story. Um, I saw characters that reminded me of my parents and my friends, I mean, the people in my neighborhood. I mean, it, when I would see it, I, I was like, I started asking myself, like, we can write about this stuff? You know, I mean, when I started to see works that, of, of people that, who, who definitely were very similar in terms of who I was, I mean, that was the thing I was asking, like, we, we can write about this? Um, which I think definitely leads me to my, if, if there's anything I feel like, if, if you get anything out of this, you know, um, I feel like it's probably the only playwriting advice I can give to anyone is tell those stories that matter to you, right? Tell those stories that you want to tell. Um, don't worry about the stories. Don't worry about uh, producing in terms of who's going to produce it or when it's going to run. I mean, don't get ahead of yourself. I mean, I, I remember myself as a beginning playwright and think, you know, I, I was already thinking about the, my, my, uh, my Broadway debut, right? And, you know, and, and yet, I mean, I've, I've been in this, uh, gosh, over 20 years and uh, still no Broadway, but I don't think that definitely um, lessens, uh, you know, in my career in terms of who I am and what I do in terms of the stories I tell. I mean, that's just not an opportunity that's happened for me. And so that's, um, so that's basically what, what I'm, uh, what I feel like, I, I, if you remember anything else, tell those stories that matter to you, write those down, write those and make those into plays. Um, the one uh, I want you to think about actually, which is, and this is just a very quick actually uh, writing exercise if you, but, and this is, so it's really short, um, tying into what I was just saying, like what are the stories that matter to you? I want you to write down, um, either type it down or write it down, um, but I want you to write down a story that matters to you. And it could be a short story. And when I'm talking about story, I'm talking about like, uh, because I mean, today I am gonna talk about adaptation. So think about um, like maybe there's a short story or, or even a, a, a novel, you know? Um, but what is that story that matters to you? you know? So just write that down, type that down, just jot that down. 
Um, and as you're doing that, I'm going to keep talking. Um, ultimately, what I'm trying to do is I want to be able to use this time as much as I can um, just to be able to uh, hopefully be able to uh, get you going and jotting some ideas down, thinking about certain things. And like I said, because I'm talking about adaptation, um, I, I wanted to kind of uh, start with some of these exercises. So like I said, write down one story. I mean, at least one, obviously, right? So there's so, there's so many others, but like write down one story that matters to you. Um, and for me, the story that matters to me uh, right now, and I'm actually going to talk about this later. There's a there's a folk tale that um, called the uh, the Ballad of Mulan, right? Those of you, some of you might be able by, might be familiar with the Ballad of Mulan, the story about the uh, it's a Chinese folk tale about a young woman who serves in place of her father, uh, serves in the military in place of her father because her father's too old, right? Um, that's actually when I was first uh, became familiar with that folk tale. I was like, wow, this is really cool. And, and I always wondered, like, this is a piece that I was really connected to. And I think it took me a while to finally realize, like, where my connections were. And I'll talk about that later. But um, I definitely wanted to highlight, like, that's definitely a folk tale that really has connected to me um, as a writer, as a storyteller. Um, so when Tlaloc uh, pitched the idea of the Latinx Super Friends um, playwriting hour workshops, um, I immediately thought um, doing one on adaptation because I felt like that's where I could be the most helpful. I mean, there's some great people uh, as, as part, of this, uh, part of this group. And I felt like, you know what, this is, this is what I know I can do best in terms of, and, and it's probably because, I mean, this is what I've been able to get work in doing um, and what I feel comfortable with. And also because I feel like um, I think in terms of adaptation, um, it's a great skill to have. I think it's a great skill for any playwright to have um, from those who are just starting out, but even those who have been doing this for a while. I mean, it's just def definitely something to have a, another tool in your pocket, right? Um, it's a great way to learn about playwriting, specifically if you're new to playwriting and you've never written a play before. Um, I think adaptation is a really great way to start out. I mean, when I teach playwriting, um, I always try to incorporate some sort of adaptation in there because I feel like it. Um, you have the model already, especially if you're using a folk tale, you're using something that's established, you have beginning, middle, and end, right? Um, and so you already kind of have this kind of outline that you're gonna go to. And it's a great way to just try it out and see, like, what, can I do this, you know? I mean, it's more of a, you know, there's a difference between, you know, saying, you know, I could do this and you read about it, but can you actually do this? Um, I kind of relate it to, you know, I've been reading about how to make bread these last couple of weeks and, and um, my sourdough starter is just, it's, it's, it's not going anywhere, but I'm going to keep trying, you know? And I was like, but I read about it and I read about all these people doing it, but when you're actually trying to do it, can you do it? And so it's all, you know, something to keep in mind. Um, and also I think great, uh, one of the re other reasons why I wanted to teach um, adaptation was because I think it's a great way to start a relationship with the theater because a lot of times the first conversations that I've had uh, with some theaters has been, are you, um, would you be interested in adapting this for us? Or, you know, we have some of these ideas for some of these plays. Um, I mean, some of these books that, you know, we've been interested in, would you be interested in adapting this for us? So sometimes I think that's been the fir my first relationship with some theaters. Um, so just to give you an overview, I'm just gonna talk about adaptation. I'm gonna give you some quick writing assignments and then I'm gonna talk some more and then give you another quick assignment. And then I'll talk more and then I'll ask questions. And then, you know, I'll answer any questions that you, uh, that you come up with. And uh, so we'll go from there. Um, so to start off in terms of when I'm talking about adaptation, I think that's the first thing is like, let's get down to the, like the language of us establishing like, what is an adaptation? Um, I never want to assume that everybody knows, uh, I know what I'm talking about. And so a lot of times I'm always, I always try to define things and I define things on how I would explain them. And so you might have a different definition and that's okay. Um, but my definition of an adaptation is when you use established source material to tell a story, that's it. Just something like when you're using some other source material to tell a story, right? And when you think about source material, you think about like novels, poems, children's books, short stories, uh, newspaper articles, another play. Um, we've seen that before in terms of and it's very common, especially like an old, old, really old plays um, 
that get adapted into you know newer versions or different versions. And it's, it, it, some people even use songs as uh, adaptations. Um, the two types of adaptations I want to talk about today um, are they definitely aren't the only ways to adapt, but I feel like these are kind of the most common, the ones that I've seen the most of. Um, and I think they're the might even when you delve in, if you decide that you ever want to adapt a play, adapt something into a play, you're going to most likely do it in one of these two forms. Um, so I just uh, figured I'd start with those. And the terms I'm going to use are terms that I've come up with. Um, what I call my doofer terms, right? The terms that may not, they may not be the best terms, but they're the ones that it's gonna do for now, right? So just, uh, I just wanted you to know that. So the first one I wanna talk about is I think actually the most common, and probably many of you are definitely familiar with this, is the straight adaptation, right? And the straight adaptation, in some circles, people do call this the uh, page to stage. We hear this term used a lot, especially when they're talking about adapting novels, or children's books into stage plays, they use the term page to stage. So I think sometimes it's like trying to clarify, like when you talk to, uh, especially if you get, if you're fortunate to get asked about adapting something, um, it's it's good to clarify, like what exactly do you mean when you talk of adaptation? Because there are actually there are different types of adaptations. Um, so in terms of the straight adaptation, um, typically these have the same setting. And I mean, this a lot, This seems very obvious, but I mean, definitely I think these are things that we should at least um, uh, recognize, right? So um, when you're adapting something uh, and as sort of a straight adaptation, it has the same setting as the original source material. For example, those who are familiar with like uh, 100 Years of Solitude, right? Um, if you've read that book, you're familiar. If you haven't read the book, you should read that book, put that on your homework list tonight. Um, those who are familiar with that, I mean, you know that it takes place in Makondo, right? And so that's definitely where a lot of it is gonna, that's, that's what we're gonna expect when you're writing a straight adaptation. Um, straight adaptations tend to have the same major characters that were in the original source material. Um, sometimes even the same minor characters, depending on you know, the length of the script, right? Um, depending on how you're gonna write it. Because if, if you're gonna try and write something as a one, if you adapt something as a one person show, which is possible, you might be able to, if you want to showcase your talents as a, not just a writer, but also as a performer, you're probably going to want to put a lot of different characters in there to be able to show your range. But let's say if you're working, you know, you're adapting uh, something for a theater that says, you know what, we can, we're only, we can only pay seven equity actors, then you got to figure out, can you be able to do all the, you might be able to have to cut some characters, combine characters, you know? Um, but Definitely when in terms of those adaptations, you have those same major characters as you had in the source material. Um, and then you have uh, uh, one other thing is definitely the, the, the storylines are definitely similar when you're adapting, when you're doing the straight adaptation, right? Um, and I don't want to say to exact because you're taking one medium and you're trying to put it into another one and it doesn't work all the time. I mean, the storyline is going to be similar, but definitely not exact. And you're going to actually see that when you're actually trying to do something, especially with like a folktale or a short story, um, definitely with a book, right? You're going to kind of have to figure those things out. But the, the storyline is definitely going to be similar. Um, probably the most well-known example of a straight adaptation is William Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, right? Uh, and some people don't even know that's an um, adaptation, which I think is great. Um, for me, I think that's one of the goals of adaptation, right, is you write it well enough that people forget about the source material. This is always not, this is not always po possible, especially if the source material that you use is extremely popular, right? Um, but if you adapt something obscure, out of print, a long forgotten novel, a short story, a children's book, and you do it well enough, people won't even think of it as an adaptation. Now, I'm not saying don't give credit to the source material because you always should credit the source material, right? Um, I mean, just think about this. So if you ever, I don't know if you've ever been to a play adaptation. Have you ever seen a play that was an adaptation of a book? And after you saw it, uh, you thought that you would have better understood it if you were more familiar with the source material. That's definitely not how, you, how I feel that, uh, adaptations should be written. I mean, audience should not have to feel that they could understand the play if they were just familiar with the original source material, right? Adaptation should stand alone. They should be its own thing, right? Um, 
because that and and ultimately that's you the playwright right that's your job your job to tell that story and you can't just say oh well you know what you know this was in the the, the book where i decided to leave it out but if if that was somewhere hinted at in your story and if your audiences feel like they needed that um you might need to figure out another way to be able to adapt that um in terms of uh the um the the adaptation that uh Romeo, that Shakespeare used uh to write Romeo and Juliet uh which is actually a narrative poem the tragical history of Romeo and Juliet some of you might be familiar with this too both of them set in Verona uh Italy same major characters right you got Juliet Friar Lawrence the nurse Tybalt um Romeo sorry Romeo Romeo a little bit different but still same major characters and even the storylines are similar You've got the feud, you know, the Montague Capulet feud. You've got Romeo slaying Tybalt, Romeo being banished, banished, as, as some people say. Um, and spoiler alert, you know, Romeo dies and Juliet dies. I mean, the same thing happens in the, the narrative poem as in the play, right? So my question to you is that, so if all those things happen, if all those things that you remember from Romeo and Juliet, and then those things happen in the narrative poem, what did Shakespeare bring? Think about that. And we'll talk about that actually. Um, so straight adaptations are very common in theater for young audiences and uh, or what we call TYA, right? Um, and this is actually how I became familiar with adaptation is because um, uh, by my work when I was working with theaters who produce uh, TYA work. Um, and because we're actually uh, talking about straight adaptations, I wanna get straight into our first uh, extra, well, actually, our kind of second exercise, right? Um, I want to, since we're talking about a straight adaptation, probably the reason why you're watching, um, I want to do a quick exercise and use uh, that I use when I'm adapting when I teach um, adaptation. So, first thing we're going to need is source material. And today we're actually going to use a poem uh, by a playwright uh, some of you might be familiar with. His name is Martin Espada. And the playwright is called Poet in the Box. And I actually I, uh, wrote Martin to get permission. So I just want you to know, I actually have permission to use this poem. And um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually read it and all I ask you to do is just kind of listen. I mean, you feel free to take notes if you want. Um, it's kind of a short poem, but I just wanted to um, we'll read it. And there we go. Everything. All right. And then we'll go from there. Uh, the Poet in the Box by Martin Espada um, for Brandon. We have a problem with Brandon, the assistant warden. He's a poet. At the, at the juvenile detention center, demonic poetry fired Brandon's fist into the forehead of another inmate. Metaphor, that cackling spirit drove him to flip another boy's cafeteria tray on the floor. The staccato chorus rhyming in his head told him to spit and curse at enemies bigger by a hundred pounds. The gnawing in his ribcage was a craving for, dis for discipline. Repeatedly, two guards shuffled him to the cell called the box, solitary confinement, masonry of silence, fingered by hallucinating drifters, rebels awaiting execution, monks in prayer. Then we figured it out, the assistant warden said. He starts fights so we would throw him in solitary, where he could write. The box, there poetry was a grasshopper in the bowl of his hands, pencils chiseling letters across his notebook, like the script of a pharaoh's deeds on pyramid walls, metaphor spilled from the light he trapped, in his eyelids, lamps of incandescent words, rhyme harmonized through voices of great grandmothers and sharecropper bluesmen. Whenever sleep began to whistle in his breath, so the cold was a blanket to him. We fix Brandon, the assistant warden said. We stop punishing him. He knows that every violation he stays means he stays here longer. Tonight, there are poets who versify vacations in Tuscany, the villa on a hill, the light of morning, Poets who stare at computer screens and imagine cockroach powder dissolved into the coffee of the committee that said no to tenure. Poets who drain whiskey bottles and urinate on the shoes of their disciples. Poets who cannot sleep as they contemplate the extinction of iambic pentameter. Poets who watch the sky waiting for a poem to plunge into a white streak through blackness. Brandon dreams of punishment, stealing the keys from a sleepy jailer to lock himself into the box where he can hear the scratching of his pencil like fingernails on Dungeon Stone. All right. So usually, typically uh, in my class, we'll then talk about the poem for a bit. 
Um, but I want you to do, here's my first exercise that I want you to do. So this is something that I call facts of the world, right? Um, and facts of the world are uh, any lines, anything that gives you kind of like a, a setting, imagery, moments, or character actions. Actually, you know what? I'm going to put the poem back up just so you can look at it again. Um, but uh, just to make sure that we understand what facts of the worlds are. Um, all righty. Let me go back here. But in terms of facts of the world, um, like I said, there, think about Romeo and Juliet, right? If we go back to Romeo and Juliet, a fact of the world is that, like, number one, it takes place in Verona, Italy. Or um, uh, another fact of the world, Romeo and Juliet, is uh, Romeo kills himself, right? He uh, drinks poison, and then at the end, Juliet. So those are specific facts. Each world um, that is created in your original source material has these specific facts that aren't debatable, right? So I want you to just think about like what you read, and obviously I'm gonna put, I mean, I'm just gonna kind of slowly uh, scroll back through here again, or you know what, I'll just read the, well, now I don't wanna read the poem again. You don't need to hear my voice, but um, I'll scroll through here again, just slowly, but just think about, but I really want you to just think about what you heard in terms of what I said. Um, what are those specific things that stuck with you? And I want you to just kind of make a list of them, right? Um, some of the facts of the world obviously could be that this takes place in the juvenile detention center, right? That's definitely not debatable. There are other things that come up. Um, but ultimately the reason why I do this is that each playwright, each person based on their own experiences are gonna come up with their own list of what they think of facts of the world are. Obviously some of them are all gonna come up with you know, some of the same, but there are some that are gonna be different and that's okay because Ultimately, you're the one who's adapting something like this. This is your story. Um, what are the things that you're going to put in there, right? Um, and so you have moments in here where Brandon, you know, starts fights. Um, he hits another inmate with a um, with a, a tray. Um, uh, the the assistant warden figures out that Brandon. Uh, has been doing this. The reason why he's been doing this is so he can be um, he can be locked up and write poetry, right? So, like I said, you just kind of write this down. And actually, you know, when this is all over, I will uh, definitely share this poem with you. Um, but I wanted to, like I said, do this quick exercise where you kind of write down the facts of the world and just really start, just think about like what I was actually saying in terms of what are the, some of the things like, you know, here's another one, Brandon dreams of punishment, right? So that's definitely just facts of the world that are established. Try to come up with 10, right? That's all, one, and that's as best you can just come up with 10, all right? I'm gonna give you about a minute or so just to do that. And I really, I'm just, what you do is just kind of jot these down. You're not, you're not trying to just do this. This is something that I try to get people to do when eventually they start doing, taking on bigger projects or either, you know, children's books or, you know, other uh, folk tales. Create your own facts of the world. Um, and I figure one of the best places to start with a poem because a poem is short, right? Um, all right. And if you didn't, like I said, I will definitely share this poem with you. And, um, and obviously if you missed some of this, you know, this is, uh, this is all being recorded. So you can always uh, come back to this. Um, so, let, so we got, let's say we got our 10 facts of the world, right? W whatever your facts of the world is. Like I said, this is definitely very helpful when you're adapting picture books and chapter books. Um, once you go through the source material once, let it sit and then go back and then like write down your list of like, what are those things that really stick with me? Those specific moments, the setting, the imagery, character actions. Character actions are really, really important, obviously things that we remember from like, if we talk about Romeo and Juliet, like we're gonna remember like when, when Romeo slays Tybalt, like that's definitely a fact of that world. So think about those facts of the world that you really remember. So thinking about that, those, that, those stories that you're interested, might be interested in adapting, what even if you've read the book a week ago, two weeks ago, a year ago, just kind of come up with your list before you revisit it. Like what are the things that you really remember, right? Um, so then when we go from there, once you got your list, like let's say you got 10, and if you don't have 10, if you have five, that's okay. But I want you to choose like the one 
that is most vivid to you right now? In terms of like what we do, what I just read in terms of that, like what is the, and, and if it's tied to a character action, even better. But if not, that's okay. But choose one of the facts of the world that is most, that you feel most connected to, most that might be most vivid to you, right? Um, possibly even what is, what is most important to you. Um, and, and frame it in the sense of, let's say if you were commissioned to write an adaptation of The Poet in the Box by Mark Venus' father, if a, if a theater came to you and said, you know, we would love for you to uh, adapt this into a play, like what is that one moment, like when you read this, that one moment that sticks with you, that you knew definitely has to be in a play. And the reason why, and once you do that, like circle it, underline it, whatever, put a star by it, like the one that you know definitely has to be in your adaptation, I feel like that's where you start with. That's exactly the place that you need to start because that's the one that you're most connected with. That might be your way into the story. If you've never written a play, um, I, I, one of the things I tell people is like, for me sometimes is I have to find my way in. Because if I can't find my way in, it's hard for me to start. Not just looking at it and saying, okay, this is the beginning of the book, so this is where I need to start. A lot of times I don't start that way. I start in the middle, I start at the end. I have to find my way in. And a lot of times it's, what am I emotionally connected to? Um, which then leads me to talk about one of the very necessary elements when talking about adaptation. One of the reasons why I use this as a, as, as a way to teach playwriting is voice. I think it's very important that your voice as a playwright comes out when you're writing an adaptation. You have a voice, you have something to say. And even though you're use, you might be using someone else's story, your voice should definitely be present. And I want you to give you an example of this. So let's think about like some story that we all know, like maybe like something like, uh, like the three locks and Goldie with three locks, Goldilocks and three bears, right? Imagine like just like somebody was doing an adaptation of that. And imagine that there were straight adaptations written by like Jose Rivera, um, Susan Laurie Parks, uh, Lin Manuel, and uh, native playwright Larissa Fasthorse. Now, if you're familiar with any of those, those four uh, writers, you definitely, and, and you're familiar with the styles of how they write, each one of those playwrights definitely have a strong voice, right? And their voice is always gonna come out in their work no matter what they're writing, even if it's an adaptation, right? And it's the same thing. How is your voice gonna come out? And going back to like Shakespeare's and his adaptation, like if he took all those memorable moments from his poem, from that poem, like I said, like all those, those moments that you know, that, that you know from the, the play are, are, most of them are all in that, that narrative poem that he, uh, he adapted it from, what did he bring? He brought his voice, right? I mean, when we think about Shakespeare, I mean, obviously one of the obvious things we talk about is, you know, uh, the iambic pentameter that he utilizes throughout, um, you know, the language. I mean, we talk about the imagery, right? Um, and also, I mean, from time to time, you even people, uh, you hear people talk about how, you know, Shakespeare made up you know, some of the words that are definitely used. And I mean, I think it's the same way. I mean, for, for especially for people who, um, uh, what do you call it? If you utilize more than one language, I mean, that's that's definitely part of your voice as a playwright and be able to use that and incorporate that in your stories and your adaptations um, because we should be able to know that that's you. I should be able to know that, you know, that you, I mean, I'm going to dirt myself. I'm going to, you know, do some romper room now, you know, it's like that you, Tlaloc, I need to know that like when I read it, that Tlaloc wrote this or that Herbert wrote this or Daphne wrote this or, um, I get to see some of the list. I forgot some of the, the other name. Laura, you know, if you wrote this, I need to know that you wrote this. And by the time I read that play, I should be able to know that your voice is all in it, you know? And that's because that's your job as the playwright. You got to put your voice in there, even if you're adapting, right? Um, so like I said, once you pick that one that is most vivid to you, that's where you start. Do not worry about, you know, starting linearly, beginning to end. Start with what you feel that is most important to you. Now, if this is my, 
um, something I'm very fortunate to be able to teach this workshop uh, longer at the Chicago Dramatist. And, um, and this is actually when I go send my students off and be like, all right, I'll give you about 20 minutes to go write. They come back and then, you know, could we get you to just see what these, uh, each other do? So definitely it's something you might want to just try. You know, if you want to, if you have time to have some homework now, you should write something like that. Um, or if you want to do that same with uh, the text that you're, you might be interested in, the folk book or something, use that. Uh, this is a great way to be able to dive in. You know, find that moment, that one that you're really interested in and start flushing that out and see what you do with. Um, so when you're, uh, I'm just looking over my notes in terms of, okay, so you're, like I said, your adaptation might actually start different than the original source material. And that's okay. I mean, if people want the book, you know, and this, because it happens all the time, right? People want the book, they can go read the book. But this is a play, a totally different monster. And as you know, and we'll discover if you ever take on adaptation, especially something like a novel, um, this monster plays by its own rules. So you gotta like figure out, like how are you gonna be able to do that? So how you, but also how you start your adaptation and how you end it, this also adds to your voice. Um, I'm talking about voice. I just want to tell a really quick story about, so uh, I was um, hired to do an adaptation of uh, Rapunzel, um, but as, a, as an opera, right? And um, those of you familiar with the story, story about a woman with long hair who waits for a man to save her. I mean, that's, that's how I explain the story. Um, but I actually initially turned it down because I, I thought that that's exactly what they wanted. They wanted this story about, um, and, but when I went, in to ask and start asking questions, my first thing um, I asked was like, do I have to stay like with the same narrative, right? Um, because I thought about it. I mean, is this the narrative that I wanna to continue to perpetuate where it's this story about a woman who sits in a castle and waits, uh, waits for somebody to save her. Ultimately it is a man. I mean, depending on obviously the folk tale you read. Um, and so I asked, I was like, is it okay if she saves herself? Um, and maybe even she might even save somebody who tries to help her, you know, being the man, right? And I feel like this totally goes along with my aesthetic as a writer. When I started to see the things that I wrote about, I like writing about strong women characters. Um, it reflects what I grew up around. And, and thankfully, I mean, and that's actually what I told him. That was my reason why I wanted to change them. And because it's a folktale, we had to stay in the same, I mean, it was, because it's a folktale, I mean, we, we got to, you know, we got to add some creativity to it. But Still, it had the same elements in terms of the same characters, same setting. You know, Rapunzel still had long hair, you know, but that storyline, it was similar. But the one thing, like I told him, I was like, I, will, I am not interested in writing a story that, where, that shows um, where she's just waiting for a man to save her. I mean, I think that, that narrative has been pushed enough. Can we change that? Um, like I said, thankfully, I had that opportunity to be able to take that on. Um, so, you can actually start there in terms of if, if you wanted to do an adaptation, that's one place to start. But I wanna actually share some things that it might also be helpful. Um, one thing that definitely is helpful is you make a list of your lists of settings and potential settings, right? So let's go back to the poem, thinking about the poem, um, some of those settings could be like the juvenile detention center, right? Um, solitary confinement, because that's definitely uh, has been in, uh, mentioned. but and you, some of the others we have to kind of create. So we're thinking about potential settings, definitely create settings that are true to the narrative. They're definitely living within the world of the narrative. So you're thinking maybe the assistant warden's office, the, a cell, um, the cafeteria, right? Um, the visitor's room, uh, the classrooms, uh, common room. Um, because if you really think about it in terms of characters, and I think this is, has to do with, you know, either if you're adapting or if you're writing plays, there's only a certain places where your characters are willing to reveal certain information, right? You know, and I think it's very important to know. And, but it's also great to have that list of settings because sometimes when you have the setting and knowing where it's gonna take place, you're gonna realize like, okay, my character's not gonna talk about this. Um, but it also might already help you ideal, like know like what's gonna happen in your play based on, I think, you know, knowing your settings definitely help way, you know, help uh might help in terms of how you're going to take the journey your character's journey right um so making a list of setting and potential setting definitely very helpful um before you start definitely it's something that i do 
just to kind of like, because sometimes I'm, I realize, man, I've, I've been in the same setting for a long time. Where are these other places I can have this thing to take place? And then what are, you know, what might that add theatrically, right? Um, also, something I do is a, a list of characters. You make a list of characters in terms of, so we've got like in this one, you've got like assistant warden, you got Brandon, you got inmates, you got guards. And depending on who your, your protagonist is, like I said, if you, like I said, if we're pretending that somebody has commissioned us to write uh, an adaptation of this, depending on who your protagonist is, will depend on who your other potential characters are because maybe you decide Brandon's not your protagonist. Maybe you decide you wanna write an adaptation that focuses on the warden or one of the inmates or um, maybe even you know uh, Brandon's lawyer. I mean, depending on on how you know, how your way into the story, right, or into the thing. So definitely, there might be a relative or a public defender. Um, who's your character's confidant? You know, especially if it's Brandon. You know, um, those are things that you definitely have to think of. I think that's very vital. Um, I think in terms of any play, is who is your character's confidant? Who's the person that your character tells secrets to? Um, uh, definitely, and it's something always worth knowing, something that might not always fit in all your plays, but it's always worth knowing who, if, if that person was around, who is your character's confidant? Um, and once you do that, like once you start identifying your potential characters and your potential places, that also adds to your voice, your voice as a character, you know, I mean, your voice as a playwright. Sometimes you have to add characters, sometimes you have to cut, sometimes you have to combine. Um, I definitely, when I, uh, I was fortunate to, to, um, to write a, uh, be commissioned to write a adaptation of a, a book uh, called Ghost Wings. And the book is out of print. And so when I was asked about it, I was asked, well, since it's out of print and it's probably not, well, it's not well known. I did a lot of research and I asked a lot of people. And, um, and I asked, the, the first thing I asked when I met with a writer was, uh, is it okay if I change the title? And I wasn't sure what the title was, but I felt like I needed something that might be able to tell me what the story is. Um, and so um, eventually this is what became my play On the Wings of a Mariposa. Um, and in this piece, I had to cut out the father character um, because I felt like this story was a story about three generations of women um, from the, uh, the, the, young, the young girl who's, who's in the play to the grandmother, to the mother. Um, and I didn't feel like the father played a significant role. So I cut him. I mean, I, I didn't kill him off. I just didn't use him. I think sometimes we, we uh, um, sometimes I think we need to explain things and especially when it comes to like, um, relationships and I felt like you know why don't we why do we even need to mention that that you know that that her father's not here for a reason it's just he's just not I mean so and I felt like it worked beautifully in the story um I talked to I actually sent an email to uh Karen Zacharias uh, asking her about her um uh, experience uh writing uh, the adaptation to Luis Alberto Urea's uh, Into the Beautiful North and she herself said that, you know, I mean, she had to take some liberties. I mean, because that's that's what you have to do when you're trying to fit into it. Um, she had to combine some characters and change the order of events. Um, and I think that's something that really uh, bogs us down sometimes. It's like when we're taking this on, like we have to fit all of it in there. And sometimes it's not going to fit. Um, if there's anything I can tell you when you're using facts of the world, right? If you create these facts of the world and it's not an exact list, but it's a list of those things that really have stuck to you as the playwright. When you create your list, the one thing you're gonna learn, which is one thing I try to also tell my uh, students when I'm teaching this is, do not feel ab obligated to use every fact of the world. It will undo you. Sometimes you will see some adaptations where they're trying to fit everything that was in the book into there, you know, the 500 page book or whatever. Um, unless you're very fortunate to have a theater that might be able to adapt, I mean, to, to pay for an eight hour production of your play, that's fine. But, you know, sometimes the story you're telling might not fit in there. And I think one good example I like to bring up in terms of adaptation, straight adaptation, the reason why I bring this up is because it's, it's published, um, is uh, there's, a, a, uh, there's a play called um, Let the Right One In by Jack Thorne, T-H-O-R-N-E. Um, some of you might be familiar with uh, Jack Thorne's work. Uh, he actually wrote the play um, Harry Potter and the Cursed Child. Um, and uh, so that play 
is based on a book and that book is thick. And if you look at, and I actually encourage you, if you're actually interested in the adaptation, look at the, read the book and then read the play. And then you're gonna see how it's been streamlined in terms of that. And it was really streamlined. Uh, and you definitely, you get to see, if you're familiar with Jack Thorne's work as a playwright, you get to see um, the, his voice really start to come out, right? Um, the other type of adaptation I want to talk about, which I think is the most popular, which would not think I'm most popular, I think it's the one that really excites me, um, is one called the inspired adaptation. Um, and these are adaptations, and you are familiar with it, I know you are, is that uh, they're adaptations that use the original source material for inspiration. So a little bit different than the straight adaptations, right? Uh, definitely something that I think all new writers can benefit from. I mean, not saying that the uh, non-new writers wouldn't benefit from this either, but I think definitely new writers can benefit from this, especially because if you're still trying to figure out like what a play is, inspired adaptation is a great thing to do. Um, when you see these type of things that uh, uh, inspired adaptations, um, when they're adaptations of uh, uh, folk tales or works that are in public domain. And when I mean, when I say public domain, works that you don't have to pay the rights for. And this is very important, I think, starting out, because unless you already have a theater attached, um, you know, uh, I think it's a great way to, you know, use, use a folktale, use something that's very old, that's accessible, so that you can be, learn how to teach yourself to, to write adaptations. And then you obviously you read other adaptations and see how the other playwrights have done it. Um, I think another uh, one that's come to me in terms of, which is I think a balance between the voice of the playwright and the voice of the author is uh, um, The Bluest Eye by uh, Lydia Diamond um, when she adapted uh, Toni Morrison's um, uh, novel of the same title, right? That's definitely, uh, I mean, those who are familiar with Toni Morrison, that's a voice right there. And to be able to fit them as a playwright, you still got to be able to do that work and hopefully put your voice in there. And I think Lydia Diamond definitely had to balance that and did a very good job of it. So definitely something worth looking into. Um, so thinking about this uh, inspired adaptation. So uh, same thing, you need source material, right? So instead of going back to the poem, I want to go quickly to another piece of source material. Um, which we all know, which I just referenced, which is Romeo and Juliet, right? So I want you to think of Romeo and Juliet and all its story, right? And, and this is in public domain, so you can do whatever you want with it. Um, and I want you to think about the story and its elements. And I want you to come up with a setting. If you can come up with one, cool. Usually if we have more time, we can come up with like five. But I want you to come up with a setting where you think this would take place, you know? Something that you feel that would, where it would work. Um, and I know we've possibly seen other people do this just in presenting Romeo and Juliet in different settings, but this is when we're talking about adaptation, we're talking about, you know, taking it into inspired adaptation, taking it into a different setting, but then also changing characters, uh, maybe even changing plot points. Um, so try and jot one down real quick. Like I said, if you have, if you already have other ideas of other ones, write those down. Um, some suggestions might even, I mean, it always comes up as people are like, oh, World War II, that's a really good time period. Uh, you know, definitely a lot of conflict in there. Uh, maybe even the time period when we, uh, uh, something like Executive 9066, uh, those of you familiar with that, with the, um, the uh, Japanese internment camps, you know, um, thinking about in terms of your own history and your own culture, you know, uh, maybe even like, uh, like the Battle of the Alamo or you know, the 50s where you had you know, like something like uh, Operation Wetback or the, the Cuban Revolution, right? Um, definitely just you know, this sense of conflict, right? Where, where you have just like something that kind of possibly represents uh, the same thing, um, represents the same thing as that feud as the Montagues and the Capulets, right? Um, I want to make sure I, I leave enough time for talking. So I'm going to kind of zip through I, one thing. So once you have your setting, once you have your setting here, um, think about this. So once you have your setting and you make up your own, thinking about if you have time later, just kind of create your own facts of the world of Romeo and Juliet and come up with a list of 20, right? And the only reason why I say 20 longer than the other one is because it's a longer play, right? There's so many other things there. Um, but I don't want you to go back and read it and do it, but I want you to just think about it. What are your, those facts of the world that happened there? 
But then start thinking about, once you start writing those down, once you get that list down, here's another thing I want you to think of. And this is what I think helps bring us, I think are elements of adapt, uh, the inspired adaptation that really start to help bring out voice. What are those plot points that you wanna keep, but what are the ones that you wanna change? How are you gonna highlight your voice as a writer? How will you illuminate what is important to you, right? Um, one quick story, I was trying to write an adaptation of, Rogelio, of uh, Romeo and Juliet. It was when I first got into playwriting and I, you know, I created my Rogelio and Juliana. And I didn't realize that what I was doing was I was actually trying to write an inspired adaptation because writing, I was trying to create, I started with the final scene, right? So uh, Romeo comes in there and he uh, really, he thinks Juliet is dead, takes the poison. And then Juliet wakes up and at some point in, in her conversation with Romeo, she realizes that she doesn't want to kill herself. She's not, she doesn't want to die for a man. Like, you know, the, the man's not worth dying for. And definitely, like I said, I, and I think that was the very beginning of like, uh, you know, like I said, when I talk about my aesthetic and the things I like to write about, about strong women, um, I think that, that's kind of, I, I pin it all back to the, that one adaptation I was trying to do, that it was uh, Juliet's voice, like, you know, that, that or Juliana's voice like no way I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do this and uh and she decides not to and that's that was the end of it um and I think that definitely you start to see like you what is those what are those plot points of especially like certain folk tales um or in the older plays like I mean it's 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 I mean you can just put it in another setting and use the same plot points but maybe there's certain character choices that really didn't resonate with you and you could change it to fit your aesthetic you know and it's definitely a lot easier when if it, when it is public domain stuff that is in the public domain because then you can really freely do what you want with it and be able to create with it i mean that's how i mean those who might be familiar with my play lucia lora i mean i when i mentioned uh, the ballad in mulan um i kind of related to that when i started writing lucia lora i wanted like how would i set this play how can I be able to adapt this that celebrates me, my voice, my culture, but also my family, like the strong women in my life? And so that's that's one of the reasons why I wrote Lucha Lora, um, is it, which is the story about a young girl who, who a uh, young woman who serves and play. Her father is an old Lucha Lora, and she serves in his place. Um, and with that, uh, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna stop there just so I can uh, leave another uh, leave enough time for questions and stuff. But uh, hopefully that was helpful. And um, I, I do plan on, uh, um, I have a list of all the people who have registered. And if you don't have, if you weren't registered, you can send me an email at alvaro.sar, S-A-A-R dot rios at gmail.com. Um, and I'll send you the same document that I'm going to send to everyone who registered uh, in terms of some of the things that I mentioned. Um, and, um, you know, just that I think that might be definitely helpful. So, cool. Voila, back to you. Oh, thank you, Alvaro. <laughs> um, no, and I want to leave some time for uh, for questions. I, sure. I do want to make sure that we're uh, uh, we don't get too bogged down on like how do we get rights to a, to a, a book and, and, right, and right. where do you find material? Because I think there's a lot of information out there about obtaining underlying rights. You can actually go to to the Dramatist Guild website and they can actually show you how to draft up a contract in case you reach out to an author or a publisher and you know you say, hey, I'm interested in 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 adapting something. Um, right, but, that's a uh, whole conversation. Yeah. That's yeah, yeah, and sometimes, you know, that stuff isn't available because, you know, some film company picked up the rights to it. So, right. you know, it just depends. It's it's never personal if you can't get the rights to something. It's usually because they've signed with somebody else or they're just not interested in in their material being. Um, in, in that case, uh, if, if there's someone who's resist, is resisting, you have to really make the case as to why their story, their poem, need, you know, why you want to tell this on the stage, why you want to show this with people live, and what it will, you know, what that will bring to a, a new audience, I guess. I don't know. It's, right. it's really, uh, that's a whole other conversation. Yeah. Well, let, let me say something real quick. Like, here's sure. what I tell people. Here's what I tell all my, my students. I'm like, look, if you're interested in adapting something, I don't care what it is, adapt it. Try and do it because you might realize you can't do it. Or you might realize, <laughs> you know what? It, this might not be worth my time. 
you know? So I think it's also worth it at least to try it. Now I didn't say try and produce it. That's a totally different monster, but I think you should at least try. I mean, I always think it's, I mean, it's, it's great, obviously within the academic setting. Um, when I teach this, you know, it's different, you know, I get to let my students kind of work on it. Most of the time they, they'll write that one scene or, but I think it's at least worth trying, but yeah, getting the rights and all that, that's a totally different monster. And a lot of times, I mean, for me, I've been very fortunate. That a lot of times I'm teamed up with a theater that already has gone through a lot of that. Um, cool, cool. So just do it for practice. Yes. Do it okay, Fia, do you wanna like pull in some hands? Yeah, absolutely. So the way that we're going to do this is if you have a question, go ahead and raise your hand, not physically, but in Zoom. And the way that you do that is go down to the bottom of your screen, click that participants button, and uh, either a button that says raise your hand will come up or you see a little like dot, dot, dot thing. You can select hand raise from there. Um, while everybody's finding that feature, I'm going to look into the chat. Um, and if you can't find the feature, go ahead and toss your question in the chat. So we're going to start with a question from uh, Danny Borba. How do you, oh no, where did it go? I had it a moment ago. How do you know if you've adapted too much or too little? I keep, hello? Okay, I think you can hear me now, right? Um, yes. Yeah, how do you know if you've adapted too much or too little? Um, I think that's, uh, I think that, that really depends uh, on the person, right? I think it's uh, one thing that helps is that once you've done it, like your adaptation, or I mean, just anything, like if you've ever written a play before, you should do a reading of it. You should do a reading with your friends in your small circle, not a big public reading, but your small circle to hear the voices. And I think you'll start to realize that maybe you did and, and just kind of even pull some of the people within you. Like, you know what, know what the journey of your character is. Ultimately, your you're, you're still applying the same elements. Know who your character is. What does your character want? What is preventing your character what, what they want? And sometimes that's the stuff that you actually have to put in to be able to get the story to flow because even like with the poem there, I mean, we start, I mean, if you think about Rick Brandon, that could be his inciting incident is the day that he learns that, that he can't go to a solitary anymore. You know? So how is he gonna be able to get there? Because that's what he wants so he can write. How is he gonna be able to do that? And that could definitely be the whole play, right? Um, there's no, I can't just give you an answer and say, okay, you hit page 90, that's too much. You know, I think it depends on, on um, on uh, really in terms of where you feel like your story is going. It's, you play with it. You just got, you really have to play with it and be able to discover that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Raise hand from Priya, you are unmuted. Oh. Hi Priya. Sorry Priya, give me one moment. Is not letting me unmute you. Oh no. Yeah, it's interesting. Can you type, can uh, Priya type a question in? Uh, maybe yeah, I think I saw it earlier. Priya, if you um, want to double check your mic really fast. Oh, I think, I think um, I see it. Um, how do you, see, yes. how do you adapt, how do you navigate adapting real life events, right? Is that, that's your question? Yes, Priya? Um, I think, you know, uh, Ooh, that's, that's a, yeah, that, that, that's a good one. That's a good okay. one. I, I think it depends. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, hi. Um, I was born in Suriname. It's a county of South America, but I was raised in Holland. And in the 90s, uh, there was a coup in Suriname, and they uh, murdered the intellectual top of uh, Suriname. And I want to write a play about that, because, but because there's so many people involved in that, so many interesting characters. And I start wondering um, if I want if I want to um, write a play about that um, because it's a, a true life story. Where do I start? Where How do much you of what? I'm sorry. 
Where do you start? That's a great question. Um, I would say if, if I was writing about a true life event, this is so you can take this advice, you can go with it, or you know, maybe you might find another player, I give you different advice. But for me, where would I start? I would create a fictional character that lives within that world. Because I think at least that is safer because then you can take some liberties in terms of, because ultimately like we as playwrights are not documentarians. And I get into arguments with many playwrights about this. Our job is not to tell exactly what happened in the history. Our job is to be able to tell a story and we can highlight specific moments that specifically happened, but we are not creating documentaries. I mean, obviously there is that form, the docudrama, and even that gets, has to get shaped. I think the safer, safest way to be able to do that, when you, if you wanna take on real events, I learned this myself because I was trying to write about a specific real event that happened in Houston in 1978, um, a riot that happened there. Um, I realized that be able to write about that be able to have, I should have this fictionalized character live within this world and experience it. But that character still has a journey, right? But you can still be able to flesh out the world somehow and maybe even have them involved. And I think this obviously this protects you because you are, you know, you have a fictional character who's living within that world. And I think that's a great way to be able to start. What, what would that character in that world, that, that, uh, that specific environment, what do they want? You know, what do they want and how is it whatever happening in this world preventing them from getting it? And what are they going to do? That's your journey. That's definitely one way to be able to approach it. I hope that helps. Um, I, I would only add that it becomes more complicated if you start to um, try to tell the story of someone's life and, and they're still alive. And, and if you don't obtain their rights, it becomes a very complicated matter because they might wind up hating the material and rescind the rights for you to tell their story. Uh, you know, I, I always err on the side of caution whenever you want to write about true life events. There are some people who have done really incredible, successful productions around the world. I think of Nirbaya by Yael Farber which took place in India. And there's a lot of, um, uh, there's a lot of document, uh, documentation about that particular production. Uh, I myself wrote a play based on a, a, a series of, of articles called Joanna Facing Forward that came out of Cleveland. And that became something that, that, that kind of ev had an evolution from docudrama to my, my own investigation with the people involved in that, in that particular um, series of events. And then it became inspired by. So, you know, you, it doesn't have to be one or the other, but you find yourself at least with a little more artistic freedom and flexibility in terms of crafting the narrative that you wanna have or, or, or sort of really utilizing your own voice when you are inspired by something, but not using the exact right. people. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, it just gets really tricky <laughs> unless yeah. you have a lot of money and you can like you do whatever they want. But but yeah. most people don't have that. <laughs> I don't. Except Hollywood. <laughs> OK, thank, thank you. you. Cool. I, I think I'm unmuted. <laughs> Hello, yes. Can you hear me? Cool. Yeah. Um, hi. So um, I love that like one of the first things you talked about was uh, TYA because I'm a TYA artist as well. And I uh, love to write for young audiences. And I have this play that I've been like thinking about. Um, uh, and it's about, you know, this young girl and she interacts with some of these like icons in history. Um, and like, for example, like Celia Cruz, you know, and just like what this conversation between this young girl and Celia Cruz would be. Um, and so this question kind of goes along the lines of what you guys were talking about. Um, you know, have you worked on a character that might have been adapted from someone in real life, a celebrity, you know, dead or alive, or what is that process? Kind of just expanding on this conversation, I guess we're talking about. Hmm. Um, no, I, I have to admit, I have not. Um, I, uh, and yet, I mean, I, I, that's, that's a really good question. And um, I, I mean, I would, I would love to be able to answer. I don't know if uh, Tlaloc might be, have a better answer, but um, 
I have an opinion about those things, but I mean, I, I because I've never actually uh, written about it, I, I don't think that I, I would be as helpful um, because I mean, for me, I feel like history is one of those things, especially historical characters. Um, and when I'm talking about historical, it's like the stuff that I can get away with, I'm gonna bend history. I mean, I feel like it's, I mean, it's been bent by the by the people who write history books. Why can't I do it? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's my job as a storyteller and that's what I'm gonna do. Mm -hmm. Malak, do you have any opinions that might help? I don't know if I, if I have any sort of like opinions, they might be a little dangerous as long as it's not the, you know, the main character. I, I mean, I'll give you an example. I'm adapting a book now and there's like a brief moment and I thought it'd be cool to include it. And, you know, it's like an appearance with, with Jane Fonda and Donald Sutherland and they're showing up at this political protest, which they did a lot in the sixties and seventies. As a matter of fact, like Jane Fonda performed for El Teatro Campesino and there's this whole video that I can, share with you all about that um the but but it's only like a cameo moment it's and it's meant to be like you know it's just a moment where they're like oh these people kind of showed up at this at this thing and but but it's not like you know it's not about them and it's not their story they're just right. there and it's sort of like fun in a way so i you know in some in some cases you can take some liberty there's also the, the question of satire which is like a send up uh, or a, uh, a uh, you know, like buffoonery of, you know, like people in the current White House administration or as, uh, you know, when Luis Valdez was writing his actos, you know, he lampooned Ronald Reagan and, and other, you know, whitewashed politicians. Um, you can, um, you, you are protected legally to, to kind of do send ups, just like, you know, artists at, on Saturday Night Live, you can actually do that. But if it's something that's really gonna be specifically about someone, and I know there are people who do like, somebody wrote a whole musical uh, based on, um, who's the education secretary? The one that we all like hate, what's her name? Betsy DeVos. Somebody did this whole musical about Betsy DeVos and hell. And, and, and you know, be because it kind of falls in the parameters of satire, you can kind of get away with that. but. I always kind of err on the side of caution it, that if it's something that's really going to be a dramatic retelling of someone's life, that it's there's 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 all kinds of steps to certain in terms of like, you know, it, it's really tricky. You you have to get permission either from them themselves or the family. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I just I just want to um, I'm I'm sorry to cut this, but I want to make sure that I mention like I mean Chavez Ravine by Culture Clash. I mean that's definitely I think a yeah. And when you're thinking about parody. Um, and I think we might actually be joined by uh, Herbert C. Wenza here. And I know we, we kind of run out of time, but definitely, I mean, uh, Herbert C. Wenza might even be a good uh, resource in terms of talking about that. Uh, because, I mean, talking about the event of how um, Chavez Ravine was eventually uh, uh, dis uh, destroyed to be able this neighborhood uh, to be able to create um, Dodger Stadium, right? Mm -hmm. um, and definitely a, a historical event that some people might not know about, and definitely some uh, some notable characters in there, um, and so definitely I think a, an example uh, of something. That Hi, can you, can you hear me? Yay, yeah. Herbert. Hey, Herbert. But, yeah, I'm glad you brought up Chavez Ravine. It's true. We had a Love lot that of play. Uh, talking to La Gente, the people that were from uh, Chavez Ravine. That wasn't the problem. It was the politicians uh, that we talked to you know, that were the problem. Um, also the, the Dodger management, you know, because these are people that are trying to protect their legacies, right. remember, that, you know. And they have lawyers. And like you said earlier, you know, they want to write the history, they want to leave it a certain way. So the minute we contradicted their legacy, that's when we got into trouble. And, um, you know, they were pressuring, they were even pressuring the, the Mark Taper Forum to, to, to censor our, our play you know, and we were not, and we weren't exaggerating. We were just, you know, talking about the other true history, <laughs> you know, and so it, it gets very interesting that way. Uh, yeah, and, and, and that play's available. People can actually read that. So I think that's definitely a, a good example for those who might want to even look in. Oh, I got to plug myself. June 1st, right? <laughs> June first, I'm going to be teaching here. I know, not official Yay. yet, but we will be sending out a, an announcement soon. Okay. Definitely, super friend. <laughs> <laughs> super amigos. Oh my God, it's expanding. Yes, as it should. Um, cool. Uh, any other any other questions we can feel? Do we have time?
I wanted to say bye yeah, again. It is 104. I'm going to give us a five minute call. Um, we have one more from the chat from Henry. I'm going to go ahead and unmute you, Henry, so that you can ask it yourself. Hi. Hello, Henry. We can hear you. Okay, so there's something I would like to adapt, but I don't like the book, but the situation that it ends on. Mm. And would it, yeah, that's the thing. The legality or, um, I mean, would I say it's inspired or, I mean. Ooh, that's a, I mean, I think if you're using the same characters, um, yeah. but uh, do, do you, is that, is that the only way to be able to tell the story? Like, do you have to use those same characters to be able to tell like exactly what you're saying? Because if you, if you don't have to. Then, well, then 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 go then go the other route. Protect I think this family. book was wasn't that great, but it has a really good ending. Mm. And I think that if it started with the ending, it could actually be something much more exciting to watch. Ah, and okay. Well, well, that story would be much more mm, better. I mean, in my opinion, I mean, I'm, right. I'm exactly to work and no. it's, I feel like I'm trashing it, but you know, it's like I would like to start at the very end. And maybe like not bring other characters that were not really, you know. I mean, ultimately, you're still doing an adaptation if you're using the same characters, um, because you you you're going to expect people be you're possibly going to expect people to be familiar with those characters. Maybe you're not, um, but if you feel like you have to use these same characters that are from this book, um, you're definitely depending on you know, like I said, I mean, either either you're going to have to try to get rights for it if it or but if it's in public domain then obviously do whatever you, you want to do with it. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, you can use that as a jumping off point. I mean, I, I mean, I think some people definitely get inspired by that, but because you're using these characters and you might even be referencing some of the storyline, yeah. um, it's, it's uh, I mean, legally, depending on, you know, I mean, a lot of times it depends on the writer, depends on who the publisher is. I mean, everybody's trying to protect their legacy, especially if they're alive, you know, and, um, and so uh, th there's a lot of factors. I mean, it's, it's, that's why for me, I always, uh, I, it's been a little, it's been a lot easier whenever I have a partnership with a theater, but I'm not saying that that's the only reason, that's the only uh, time that stops me from adapting um, because yeah, I mean, I, I think it just as you're right. I mean, I think you can use uh, the ending of a novel as a jumping off point, but you're using somebody else's material, somebody, you know, that, that's been, uh, that, you know, that they work to create and, um, and you're taking it from there. And so if you're expecting audiences, especially if you're really gonna connect it um, and you're expecting audiences to, 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 to be connected to it, to this material that's already been established, I mean, you're, you're adapting it somehow. So you should definitely be able to make sure you get the rights for that. Um, and then, you know, it's, and, and, and it's, it, it's always, there's a negotiation because that writer is gonna, I guarantee you that that writer will be protective uh, depending on who they are. Some might, some might say, you know what, do what you need with it. But some uh, are very protective of, uh, of what they've written. I mean, you have to think about it. I mean, depending on how many years it took to write it. I mean, yeah. you know, it's, there, there's mm -hmm. a lot of factors that go into this thing. You know, it's, it's not easy. I, I try to tell people, try and stay away from the new stuff, you know, unless you got a theater attached because there's gonna be a lot. I mean, the new stuff is really protected. The, a lot of them, the, right, the movie rights have already been sold which means the stage rights go along with it, some, most contracts. Um, and so unless you have a theater that's, uh, that, that's gonna help you go navigate that, you might need to find something else. You know? mm -hmm. I mean, if it's a historical event, right. like, uh, like for example, Chavez Ravine, do I, do I wanna write a play about Chavez Ravine? Sure. Will it be like culture classes version of Chavez Ravine? Probably not. It'll be something completely different. But it's based on a historical event, and you can tell that particular story in a different way. It, right. it, uh, if it's if it's from the book itself, then you have to. I mean, I think you have to reach out to the author. Yeah. But if it's about an event that the author pulled from, that doesn't mean that you have to follow the what the 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 book in any kind of way. Right. If it's a, um, so it you know like there's like five adaptations of the Theranos thing that happened a couple of years ago. Uh, I don't know if you know anything about that. The whole 
blood testing from a drop of blood thing that oh right, anyway. right yeah, yeah, yeah. so uh, you know there's like three or four adaptations like out there and like it's just like this it's insane a podcast a book it's just it's like you know people will, will you know you can adapt from from one particular event but it'll be from their perspective so it just depends on like the availability of like the you know the facts that you right, can, right, right. you choose to write from so i don't know yeah and in I, your I particular mean, case i'm not sure yeah. go ahead oh no i yeah i didn't i was just saying like i thought it was fiction like i mean in terms of fiction yeah but like historical events like yeah then you know you can play with them but if it's actually yeah. a fiction book then you're yeah you're you're definitely yeah oh is that herbert's hand yes yeah, we got, just, unmuted Herbert, and we are uh, yeah. we're getting close to time. All right. Yeah, I just want. Yeah, I want. I'm glad we're on this subject because I just wanted to caution you guys about working with uh, authors that are alive. I like to adapt from uh, dead authors because that's you know it's a lot easier. Uh, once you get into the live authors, they have you know they don't understand our process as well either. You know, we uh, Rick and I adapted a a, a, a novel from this a friend of ours, close friend of ours, and everything was cool, right? But then when we, when we put it out there, it said uh, the title of the play, the play by Herbert Seguenza and Rick Salinas, right? Adapt, adapted from the book so-and-so, right? Well, the author got really, really uh, upset with us because he wanted to be, he wanted, to, he wanted credit as a playwright. Uh, and we're going no no it doesn't work that way we did the play we had, we streamlined it we had you know we we did a lot of rearranging we yeah. added our own stuff you know what i'm saying and you know we gave you credit as the you know author of the novel but you cannot get credit as a playwright because you did not work you didn't do one iota on the play you know what i'm saying yeah we took mm -hmm. some talk here and there but again there's he did, he did not realize how many hours and how much, you know, uh, intellectual, you know, property we had to put into the into the adaptation. So you got to be really careful about that and make sure that all that is uh, laid out ahead of time. And so what he did, you know what he did? He took it away from us. So we put all this work in a whole year and we ended up with no play because it was adapted from his novel. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. I, I've had stuff taken away from me um, and, and some of it had to do with the person who was involved. I mean, I was working with a, a <laughs> they're, they're, the people who are involved, they, they wanted to protect the property. And so they wanted to be able to rewrite some of the play. And so I was like, no, this, this isn't a collaboration. It, it, yeah. You know, and, um, and uh, but yeah, and that happened. So I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because that's, that happens. And that's why, yeah, let's work with the dead writers a lot easier. <laughs> Thank you, Herbert, for that. I think, uh, Thea, are we at time? Yeah, I think that brings us to time. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you. And uh, like I said, if you, aren't, if you weren't registered, if I don't have your email, just feel free to send me an email. Um, I, 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 I mean, really, what am I going to do? I mean, I, I would love to. But I thank everyone for, for participating. Thank you, Tlaloc. Thank you, Thea. Thank you, HowlRound. Um, thank you for everyone just taking time Yo. to schedule and coming. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, happy 420, everyone. Smoke him if you got it. <laughs> um, yeah. Anyway, Alvaro, this was awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, you. I hope you keep coming back, and I hope all of you keep coming back because uh, we have some really, um, really awesome folks coming in. Uh, next week we have Cristina Quintana, aka yeah. CQ. Uh, she, her show, uh, she's writing for a show called The Baker and the Beauty. Um, uh, she's a uh, Cuban, but grew up in New Orleans, now lives in New York, and she's, uh, and they're really awesome. So I hope, uh, hope you can make it. Thank you. All right, there. All right. Thank you all so much. We will see you next week. Same time, same place. <laughs>